Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so this is the final session before we break for lunch. And in some ways, uh, the group work and the other bits will continue. But in this session, we've just heard of people's real experiences. We've shared perspectives. We've identified challenges. And now I'm going to move on to what we have promised, that we look at systematic ways of converting many of our commitments, many of our uh, investments into guarantees. So therefore, we are looking at how women's leadership can be enhanced in so many different ways. And one of the ways it can be done is through human rights-based approaches. We get an opportunity here to actually challenge many of the assumptions about what are human rights. So basically, uh, what I'm going to communicate right now is how we can talk about international law, international rights. We can talk about the sustainable development goals and in terms of living in cities, new urban agendas. But what are these human rights? What are the potential and the limits? And I'm going to focus on some of the things that matter. Livable cities, we're going to use issues of housing and particularly land and property rights. And in fact, we're going to now move on to understanding the framework <laughs> itself, which is all about how we need to be conscious in our analysis of what the problems are and the way we respond. We identify what are the rights we are entitled to, but also who's going to deliver them. But most importantly, all this will be just words unless we can address capacity gaps. And we're also going to then think of the next step forward. So I would not detain you because most of you, in your experiences, but also in your leadership experiences as community leaders, as professionals, as activists, as policy makers, are aware that we are facing quite a dire situation where women's unequal access and control over economic resources is a huge problem. But of course, today we have looked not just at the challenges that we face in the world that we live in, but also for many of the worlds that we are connected to, whether it be African countries, societies, Asian, Caribbean, and so on and so forth. So the reason why we're talking about human rights is simply because, uh, as Frida, you talked about UN Women and several of the other agencies uh, that we work with essentially have this mantra of leave no one behind because we know that the people who are left behind are usually the women, are the young people and children, and our vulnerable communities. So human rights-based approach essentially asks those kind of questions for us to think more consciously about who is being left behind, why, and what are the rights that uh, they are missing right now, and then what are we going to do about it, who has to do something about it, and what are the actions that we need to actually take. But I'd like to also point out that most of our discussions today with our three brilliant speakers have always focused not just on the fact of gender, whether we are women or men, but the intersectionality. That ultimately, as we saw, ethnicity, race, uh, you know, something language, religion, age, all that comes into focus. So many of our approaches need to recognize that you can't flatten out the identity of women as just the same. We, as you just pointed out, Frida, are actually quite privileged in terms of having the education of being over here. But the formidable obstacles that some people face because of multiple reasons is something that human rights needs to contend with. So first of all, when we're talking about addressing and making progress towards the sustainable development goals, we need an evidence-based research. Unless we're able to show through our data and through effective monitoring how we're making progress, it will still remain just words. So mobilization is important. That's why we are focusing now on the champions that all of you are, the leaders you are. But one of the ways of actually, uh, you know, make, of having concrete efforts is to use an established framework like the legal or the human rights framework. But I must emphasize, that's not the only way forward. So the key principles, if you're looking, let's say, at sustainable cities, and here I'm using this uh, paradigm only to talk about broader, where they are fair, where they're safe, where they're healthy, accessible, affordable, resilient cities, you need to have active participation. You need to have empowerment. You need to have accountability. And you need to have equality. And something that has uh, you know, kept coming up. So for example, in the SDGs, you have a range of approaches. We don't just look at SDG in terms of poverty, elevation, or gender, but various dimensions that uh, women and, in fact, everybody else are involved. And as you know, uh, under the goals, we have targets which are basically making progress according to indicators. And I want to just talk about one of them as an example today. But also recognize, as we have done today, uh, I'm referring here to the new urban agenda, which, as you know, was adopted by the United Nations in 2016. 
then most of our efforts in terms of empowerment are not just civil and political rights. It's not just your ability to uh, say what you want to. It's got a social dimension in the particular context. It's got a political dimension, the economic, and of course sustainability and environmental, uh, you know, uh, significance. So human rights, we're talking about a basic minimum standards, you know, of how we can have access to services, how we can ensure we are not discriminated, the actions can be under the rule of law. And that way, we can have that relationship with the state, where the state, of course, in, on one hand is a protector and sometimes uh, looks away and sometimes the violator of human rights. So what do we mean by human rights-based approaches? All interventions, everything that people do on the ground and in policies should actually further the realization of human rights. We'll talk about what they are in a moment. And therefore, I'm, I'm going to be slightly repetitive over here, but to say that if you can just think in the most simplistic terms, people have rights and governments and others have responsibilities to deliver on them. But it's not just about uh, you know, rights holders and uh, duty bearers. It's about the whole process and how we do things. So what I know that many of you know is international human rights instruments. They are being adopted by the community of nations. They actually set out in normative terms on what is owed to uh, individuals. And you know that there is, uh, apart from the Universal Declaration, various treaties, civil and political rights, economic, social and cultural rights, CEDAW particularly on women, uh, Convention on the Rights of Child, uh, racial discrimination in terms of disabilities, refugees, migration and so on. These are all, as I uh, suggested, come together. So we have rights because of the fact that we're human beings. But a particular context or particular identities, uh, in fact, invoke some of these treaties much more. But having seen this, uh, it's not merely at an international level that we're talking about, the United Nations level. We know that we have the European Convention of Human Rights. And in Africa, you have the African Convention, uh, the Charter. Uh, and then you have in the UK uh, domestic legislation. But uh, remember that human rights are constructed in local context to customary religious and traditions, which of course uh, could be a huge problem because human rights is, um, a lot of people are skeptical because of this whole idea that uh, traditions, societies, uh, which can be beneficial but also can be harmful. We have patriarchal societies. And people tend to dismiss human rights either because they're too political, we know that they are very selective uh, use of it, sometimes uh, you know, to uh, stereotype certain communities and the problems, too technical because you know, these are what lawyers do, it's too difficult. But really, the reason why we are focusing on human rights over here is because it provides the solutions. It provides remedies. There cannot be a human right unless you have remedies, whether you're talking about restitution, compensation, just satisfaction, and so on. So let's move on, therefore, to say, give some examples. So let's think of adequate housing. So the adequate housing can simply be put the right to live somewhere in security, peace, and dignity. But the normative part of it happens to be whether it be size, whether it be quality, and, and all the services that are actually involved. So therefore, if you talk about urbanization, and I'm picking this up from much of the UN speak that we have, you need to have a whole range of rights to information, not just to housing, but that's related to water and sanitation, health, including sexual and reproductive rights, food, education, work. And therefore, the availability, accessibility, affordability, quality are the things that go on. But let's stop for a moment and think of uh, this rapid urbanization that's taking place. How many people actually live in slums uh, across the world? I mean, half of the world now lives in cities, and in those cities, we have slums. All challenges in terms of water, sanitation, sufficient living area, security of tenure, and slums are still, for many people, not available. I mean, we, we can't just dismiss slums as places of deprivation. I mean, there are the opportunities over there and so on. So there are significant, and, and in my work, uh, so I've worked with uh, UN Habitat and UN agencies, uh, particularly focus on property and land rights because it's so important. The important in the uh, very many different ways. When you have land, you're able to access a range of uh, human rights. And then, I'll, I'll just give you one example. I don't need to read the most obvious things. So wherever there's violence against women, you can see that women who have access to property, who have their own land or their own house, are at lesser risk of uh, attack and violence. I mean, in my earlier work as a public prosecutor, 
uh, as a Supreme Court Commissioner and then later on on specific projects. I realized working with, uh, in, for example, in India, with people who are untouchables, they're called the, the Dalits, or with refugees, or with people who are in forced labor, the common condition over there is deprivation of property rights and particularly land. So they, therefore, uh, the, n the, the access to land in most countries for women is a huge problem. But land is not just about um, an economic asset. It is about identities. It's about social meaning and so on. The reason I'm putting this up is just to explain that we are not only talking about a quantitative assessment of rights. So, for example, how many women actually own land? How do you find that out? Well, you try to find out through the documentation. Sometimes you might have documentation, but you are not able to exercise control over it. So really, interestingly, the sustainable development goals uh, in terms of target 1.4.2, forget the numbers, not only requires us to look at the sort of documented titles, but also perception, because your security and your ability to access your primary and secondary rights, not just ownership, but, but you know how you like to use land, is based on perceptions. So this is an area that we have been working with uh, at UEL, and really this has enabled us to sort of bring in um, the whole idea of a continuum of rights. So remember, one of the difficulties that we have in the legal field is, of course, that laws are supposedly uh, gender neutral. But, but the fact that the historic injustice, the cultural problems, requires you to be gender responsive, not just uh, gender sensitive. So, for example, when you recognize women's access to land or property or, for example, health, you need to know that there are a variety of ways in which things impact women differently. That, that's what leads us to the whole question of what are human rights. We put this up a little earlier to talk about the nature of human rights. We talked about non-discrimination, participation and accountability. Now, what does that actually mean? We said that that means that we need to be clear the rights for everybody means that uh, people can assert those rights and there are others who have to deliver it. And now I'm going to move on to try to explain pretty quickly as to how at various stages uh, human rights based approaches are implemented. The way we look at a problem needs to be a lot more detailed in understanding why there's gender discrimination both in terms of immediate and structural differences. So unless you know why these problems are occurring, as many of our speakers have addressed, they would not be able to come up with short-term, medium-term and long-term responses. The question we need to ask is who is affected, who is not doing the job, and then respond to it in terms of understanding the patterns that we need to change. So that analysis also requires us, as we have said right in the beginning, to understand who are the rights holders, and uh, so you, you give rights uh, assumption that people can be empowered, but what is the nature of the vulnerability or marginalization? What is the data that actually differentiates various categories? What is, for example, the inputs that we can have from the professional groups, the academic institutions, from civil society? And most importantly, how does data actually work? Whose data is it? So one of the challenges, uh, so I work uh, in several capacities, uh, with um, women's groups. Uh, so, for example, I sit on a, a board which is called Advisory Group on Gender Issues that advises the UN Under Secretary General on gender equality issues. I do know a little bit how it is to be uh, of a different gender. So there are 16 women and one man in there. So sometimes I'm, I'm told my place, and rightly so. <laughs> Shut up, you're a man. How could you understand? But the point is, you, you reach out, and, and could I just say that it's easy to talk about things, but to really experience and understand. So when we talk about uh, data being collected about women, is there ownership at the community level, at the civil society level, with women? How is this data going to be used? In some ways, there's a, there's a fear that the kind of clever, cute ways in which development is handled might actually set back, in some ways, the sort of natural um, uh, you know, achievements that women have made over this period of time. So let's keep in mind when we talk about evidence-based approach is much more broader than just data. And also here, their roles. So rights holders cannot be all women. They have to be evaluated on the basis of um, their context, their vulnerability, their priorities. And as I will come on to most importantly, capacity to engage. Just because we have either the time, the space, or the ability to engage with some of the issues, you cannot guarantee that others would do so. We were just talking uh, 
but we hear that most women, for example, are not able to participate because they have care responsibilities. They have uh, health uh, or other um, uh, responsibilities in terms of either somebody else or themselves and etc. So the same way, we need to look, we need champions, male champions, female champions, but also champions within government in every single sector, whether they are academics, policy makers, researchers, professionals, and donor community and etc. Who are the various actors? What are the roles and responsibilities? And also, how do they report? How do they work? An understanding of who's out there, what we need is important. But ultimately, it comes down to delivery. And delivery and implementation is all about some of the self-organizing that communities do themselves, but equally in terms of holding the states to their human rights um, responsibilities, which essentially is respect. Respect the rights. You know, as you're aware, we use the term positive obligation and negative obligation. Sometimes they are uh, the main responsibility of the government is not to interfere with rights that are naturally exercised by people. But at other times, they also have positive obligations where they need to intervene to prevent or to be proactive in terms of discrimination and other things that exist. So they see that uh, uh, others should not interfere. So laws, remedies, and to fulfill. So sometimes it's about resources, but it's also about ensuring uh, you know, fair distribution and access and so on and so forth. So respect, protect and fulfill. So we need to look at those obligations the same. And I just want to pick up over here that we're not talking about the state itself. Sometimes uh, it, it could be uh, corporate responsibilities or businesses or other non-state actors, including communities and others. So the idea of duty bearers is much more broader than just the state itself. Now all this is talk and so much of the activities that uh, we carry out so uh, in a new role where I'm the uh, co-chair of the um, Stakeholders Advisory Group uh, Enterprise, we call it, is really to advise the Under Secretary General, UN Under Secretary General, on how we can have a meaningful and outcome-driven uh, engagement on, on policies, strategies, and uh, implementation. And we identify that apart from having a tool-based approach and so on, we also need to develop uh, effective engagement with all stakeholders and address capacity development. So at this university and through this GCRF fund, by uh, adopting new approaches, that's what we're trying to do. So let's look at how we carry out this analysis, uh, not just in terms of what happens, but what is missing over here, because that alone can lead us to uh, propose action. Whatever you do, your, your project might be huge, your project might be small, but there are practical ways of monitoring and responding to that. So we've already seen, in order for us to get to that position where we actually harness and utilize human rights over there, what is required? What is required in terms of awareness or what people need to know, uh, but also clarity on the skills, abilities, resources, responsibilities, um, you know, authority, empowerment, and so on and so forth. So in many ways, uh, a human rights-based approach is checking these kind of things. If you want to change, let's say, about uh, domestic violence or female genital mutilation, or you're talking about general broader issues of, uh, let's say, a water shortage, or you're talking about uh, sanitation issues, you need not only to identify a problem, but also, uh, you know, who are the people who are going to act. And those rules are important. And their roles do not exist in a vacuum. People might really want to do things, but do they have access to the resources? Do, are they able to take those uh, decisions? And are they able to communicate? So a systematic way, uh, and I'll come to, so again, in terms of tenure security, representation, resources, uh, lacking knowledge and technical skills, access to justice, mechanism. So this is, I'm, I'm running through this particular session pretty quickly because we will talk about this further, and these slides are going to be available on our websites and communicate with you. But to talk about things that we've already talked about, what are the challenges with duty bearers? Don't just assume that we can demonize them. And sometimes uh, governments or other uh, people who have responsibility behave uh, illegally or irresponsibly, but many times they also need the capacity. And uh, particularly in Africa, if you look at uh, progress that you want to be made and, and some parts not being made and we ask questions, we cannot dismiss it as just lack of political will or governments not wanting to do. In my uh, working with uh, in several countries, I help write the laws in uh, Somalia or I'm just coming back from Liberia where I'm helping the policy uh, uh, framework in terms of slum relocations and, and also working in, in Saudi Arabia and some training or Indonesia, we know that governments actually welcome 
uh, or, or identify what are the needs they have. And that's why I thought it, it resonated with what you said, that there are opportunities and we need to positively engage with them, both human and financial. So how do you reduce this gap of capacity uh, that, that you have things that you can offer and contribute? So what I put up over here is, uh, I'm sorry, this, this is a lot of stuff over here, but you know, just think about it in terms of four steps. Okay, the first step is your analysis. How do you understand the problem? First of all, we need to be focused. I mean, we can't solve all the problems uh, overnight. I know many of you operate at various levels. But uh, if you're talking, uh, as we will a little further down in, in many of our engagement, land and property rights, is have you identified the problem? What are the power relationships? Who are the actors? What is the most important human rights are involved? What are correlative duties? And uh, where do they come from? So sometimes you don't have to call it human rights. They can be constitution, domestic laws, international human rights. And have you identified then what are the capacity gaps that exist among ourselves and also with the others? So that's the situational analysis. And that's why a human rights-based approach allows us to look in sort of concrete terms as to what is the problem, who requires to do it, not in terms of, um, uh, shall we say, I have sympathy, I want to do charity, and it's, no. These are rights, these are obligations, they are in concrete terms, and these can be asserted by people. This is what empowerment is all about. So once you have identified the problem through the human rights-based approach, you go into project design and pla uh, planning. So again, those issues of not just who are the key actors and duty holders, but what do the treaty monitoring bodies? So one of the things that we saw is that what is important about international uh, treaties is not just because they've got a lot of words which appear to be strong, but they all have mechanisms. So understanding about mechanisms, namely the implementation bodies who will uh, look at the performance of states is very, very important. What are the interventions? So sometimes you can use those uh, uh, levels of intervention and so you, we need to think about strategically what are the interventions and activities required. And that itself is a capacity that cannot be top down but happens at various levels. We move on to implementation, project implementation. So again, have we identified the implementation strategies because we've talked about human rights but how you do it, who does what. Have you looked at all the human rights principles but uh, at every step? Have you thought of specific obligations? Remember the words that we used, respect, you know, just, just stay away from interfering, protect, be proactive, and ultimately to provide the resources and ensure that everybody gets over them. So you test the project design by ensuring your human rights-based approach. Have you really uh, catered and understood and responded to the capacity of rights holders to claim the rights? For example, access information, organize, advocate, policy change, get access to justice. So unless you are able to provide uh, or share those capacity en enhancements, these are all mere words and inspiration. They're aspirational. So finally, uh, how do we know we're making progress? You know, five years down the road, you go back and said, we had all the resources, we all got together, we had great uh, inspiring leaders. What have we done in our respective worlds where we could make a difference? So can you actually measure what has been produced in your uh, interventions. So that's the, uh, you need to have indicators, clearly. You need to have targets, and I know that's very difficult because we often don't have the baseline, and therefore a research methodology uh, can be helpful in understanding that the results-based management or the monitoring is important. But equally, you can measure the progress that's been made on legal policy and institutional level. So we're not merely talking about provision, uh, etc., but also the framework in which the rights holders can work with the duty bearers to have the kind of outcomes. So outputs are one thing, outcomes, impact is another. And then you need to measure that kind of positive changes in the life, dignity, and well-being of the rights holders. And mind you, we are talking about uh, individuals, we can talk about families, groups, and again, that is needs to be built in. Finally, uh, if you're running a project or a program, let's say in relation to land and property or in relation to health or any other thing, you need to be able to actually process all the human rights principles and, uh, and as I've said, uh, taken from a huge, uh, what do you call, wide range of human rights instruments, break it down to five or six principles and saying, let's say on equality or participation or uh, engagement, inclusion. How have you made 
progress. So what we like to do is, uh, and I'm, I'm making this uh, appeal to you on behalf of University of East London as part of this particular project, which is on uh, human rights based approach and also uh, Professor Alam, is that this part of a series of um, engagements, dialogue, uh, training sessions. We had uh, uh, at the UN Habitat Assembly, and as I said this morning, with the uh, uh, UN and, uh, meetings with the World Bank, with the Arab League, at the Urban Forum in particular countries, ways in which we are engaging with women leaders, and women, or rather you could say women leaders are engaging with us. But there are points in which uh, you know, concrete plans are being developed. I have perhaps given the impression that human rights is this mantra that we can use as I pointed out right in the beginning. It is not. There are various ways in which we mobilize, we engage, we deliver. But human rights can be one of the quivers in the, uh, uh, what do you call, approach that we use. And um, also we are, we are trying to document, we are trying to develop. So this is in some ways trying to create the evidence of the approaches, some, in some cases strategic planning, but most importantly I think is finding the common ground to go uh, ahead together. So I'm going to stop over here because I know lunch beckons, but I'd like to open up for any comments that you have, uh, any observations, and certainly any questions that you have. Thank you very much. <laughs>